Welcome to Women's Basketball. UConn has been waiting for you. You are Locked On UConn, your daily podcast on the UConn Huskies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On UConn your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, for the better part of 30 years, UConn women's basketball have been, has been celebrating and leading the charge, not just the college game, but the game of women's basketball in general. And the question that I have for the rest of the country is, what took you so long? Why did it take so long for the media? To come around on stars, as Colin Cowherd put it the other day on his show, people like Caitlin Clark, even non-UConn players, well before this Caitlin Clark phenomenon started. Candace Parker, who is now an analyst who does NBA coverage. Shamika Holtzclaw. Even going further back, Cheryl Miller, Nancy Lieberman, have been some of the best players and minds in the sport for decades. Then you have UConn. This singular, incredible force started many, many years ago, decades ago, who have been supporting in Connecticut its women and watching them climb the mountain for for years. There's no primetime slot for this UConn versus Iowa game on Friday without Rebecca Lobo. UConn remembers its point guard that year, Jennifer Rosati. Carol Walters. Nikisha Sales, former all-time leading scorer. Some more household names. Sue Bird. Swin Cash, one of the all-time greats and all-time greatest names of all time. Diana Taurasi. Renee Montgomery. Tina Charles. Four-time All-American Maya Moore. Brianna Stort. And now, of course, Paige Beckers all led by the greatest coach of all time in the women's game, Gino Oriema. So what took so long? Did we need someone to shoot deep threes, the Steph Curry of a women's basketball to have that crossover appeal? That's what I've heard some folks say, and I call BS on that because didn't we just have Sabrina Ionescu from Oregon who is doing similar things to what Caitlin Clark has done? Didn't we just see that? Now she plays for the New York Liberty. Did we need to build up rivalries? Is that the case for this phenomenon where it was the, and I'm doing this in quotations, the wholesome Iowa versus the, you know, rough and tumble, bad girl LSU squad or South Carolina. Some of that has some coded language. That's not mine. Um, I, I believe that this rivalry talk is 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 based some in fact i buy it more because that rebecca lobo jennifer rosati carol walters yukon team had to beat the big bad wolf at that time tennessee and pat summit and carol lawson and those in that in that group they weren't stars they were stars they were selling out arenas arenas i'm sure at that time for what the women's game was drawing, there was a ratings bonanza. I remember watching that game as a kid at 14 years old. I believe it was on EBC. So if that's the case, if you're just talking stars, Diana Taurasi and Sue Bird aren't stars? Brianna Stort? Hello? Gino? Gino Oriema's a star. Is it becoming because he's a man and that he is leading women in, in the sport? I don't buy that either. See, I think for me, the part is, you know, I feel Caitlin Clark and Iowa represent, you know, more of, or this is, I feel like what the beat, the, the ESPNs and the Fox of the world feel as if Caitlin Clark and Iowa represent more of the country. They've made Kim Mulkey to be the villain, Angel Reese to be the villain. It's really just well-produced drama. So kudos to ESPN for that, but it's hard to get behind a team that you feel is invincible. And I think at times UConn women for many years has felt that way. So I think I get that. And with this amazing uh with this with it is with as amazing as Caitlin Clark is in Iowa, 
you know, with in in there was an opportunity that was missed by major networks to make bigger stars out of the pioneers of this sport. And the frustrating thing I think that all of us have that have been following UConn women's basketball since the early 90s is we're happy that you're here. We're a little annoyed that you it took so long to RSVP. So as John McClain says in Die Hard, welcome to the party, pal. Next up, I'll tell you why the history of dominance is going to lead to another title appearance for the UConn women. I'll tell you more about that after this. The Fire TV Stick was my first venture into the streaming platform world. Now, Fire TV is your ultimate destination for sports, offering live games, highlights, and in-depth analysis. With Fire TV, you get an amazing viewing experience on smart TVs or by simply plugging in the Fire TV Stick to your existing setup. This grants access to millions of movies, TV episodes, and even free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, men's and women's, Fire TV has got you covered. Fire TV recently introduced Fire TV channels, providing steady stream of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands. All for free. This includes content from us at Locked On, as well as all the major pro leagues and college conferences. Fire TV channels let you dive into, ga in, into game analysis, highlights, and more, keeping you up to date on the latest in the sports world. From March Madness to the NBA, we've got you covered. Okay, so... Let's look at this objectively. Do you know Oriema is the unquestioned greatest coach of all time on the women's side? In 1995, his women were transcendent. And 11 titles, 11 titles later, I think he knows a thing or two about coaching. I fully expect the UConn women to be Caitlin Clark in Iowa. But not because they're going to create some incredible defensive scheme around stopping her. But knowing that Gino has the experience, they're going to play great defense against Hannah Stolke, Kate Martin, Sydney Afalter. And just looking at last game against LSU, Kate Martin averages 12 points a game. She had 21. Hannah Stolke averages 14. She dipped a little bit. She had eight. Sydney Afalter had 16. She averages usually eight points. So that in two cases, Iowa had two starters double their averages. And Caitlin was not her normal self. She was well above average. You know, she had 41. So when you look at it, the formula for Gino clearly is make, make Caitlin as uncomfortable as possible, send some doubles. Maybe play a little zone, but it has to be matchup. I I would love to. And again, if if you're a, if if you're listening to this and you're a huge Gino Oriema UConn fan, I don't remember him doing this. But if so, if, but if someone listens to this and says, "Oh, I remember a time that this happened," wouldn't it be interesting if they put I'm trying to think who this would work with? Maybe an Ice Brady or um, Nika Mule, someone to just kind of face guard Caitlin. And just played a box and one against her, and just threw a junk defense. That's what it's called, you know. I don't, I don't consider it a junk defense, but that's, you know, in the the basketball pantheon, you know, people typically call it that. I don't know if that's going to happen. I do know that I'm yawning a lot because I'm, I've talked so much for a living. Um, but Gino, Gino has a lot of tricks up his sleeve, so it wouldn't surprise me. If he did something like that, typically older coaches, I hate to put him in that box, but typically older coaches don't tend to veer from, you know, who you are. I've had coaches on shows before. It's, you know, at this late in the year, you are who you are, but it's also an interesting thing to pivot to a new thing because playing a box in one is not Typically, particularly difficult. It's not like you're setting up a new press, you know, like a two-one-two or a one-three-one, or you know, kind of a you know a, a, a half court or three-quarter court two-one-two to kind of just slow the game down. It just would be interesting to see if they just kept the ball out of her hands because 
in watching Caitlin this year, she thrives when it, there's like all of this, you know, pressure on her. So she's able to not only get her shots off because she creates her own shot, like few have in, in the women's game, but she also catches you by surprise with some of the backdoor cuts. Her, her teammates are connected with her. She really does have a great feel for the game. So I say that because we've seen that with Paige before. I feel like Paige uh, Beckers is the better overall player. Um, her team is definitely, you know, as, as far as what they have right now with five players being out for the season, only seven players are healthy. So the, the issue that I have and the only issue I have with them again, against, um, Caitlin and Iowa, this game is can they stay juiced up for this game? Right. You know, I, I could tell they were getting pretty tired at the end of that USC game because Juju Watkins is a handle handful and you know they couldn't make some free throws so those fatigue that came into I think they missed seven free throws in a row so Gino has to watch his team's fouls you know with only seven healthy players but I fully expect this to be a great game um and right now if you if you were to bet on this game or if you were just to look at the ESPN kind of what they call that power index I think it's 60 40 on on UConn um, if I take a quick peek at that, and I will, um, I can tell you right now. If we go UConn versus Iowa, let's check it out. Let's see. UConn women. Here we go. Yes, yeah, sixty point eight percent. We'll go to the game cast. Wish I could share this with you guys so you could see it on YouTube. But trust me on this: if you were to go on it, it's six in matchup predictor. ESPN's according to ESPN Analytics, sixty point six percent chance for them to win the game outright. I always got a thirty nine point four percent. So overall, you know, they feel like UConn has a better team, and I agree. I mean, UConn was thirty three and five this year. I was thirty three and four. They both play in a, in a good conference, uh, Big East and Big Ten. Um, Connecticut's a two and a half point underdog, so that just means it's basically even because it's neutral site. Um, if this was being played in Gamble, I think UConn's a four or five point favorite. Iowa, same thing. So neutral site, I think they give it to Iowa because they've, you know, the perception is that Caitlin is the the better overall player than Paige, and I don't agree with that. Um, so we'll see. I think again, when it comes down to it. It's gonna it's gonna be about not not Paige versus versus uh Caitlin. And trust me, I've had multiple people reach out to me and say this, you know, these teams aren't one team versus the other, that UConn um over the years has really kind of found a way with multiple players. And we're gonna get into my top five UConn women's basketball players of all time on in the next segment. Um, but I say that to say that. Aaliyah Edwards, um, Nico Mule, Ashlyn Shade, Ice Brady, they're all going to have to play a big part. It's not, it, Paige is not going to give you – she could give you 40, but I don't think she wants to do that. I don't think she has that. She definitely has it in her, but she is more of a, a facilitator who also scores. She's more efficient. So I really can see Aaliyah Edwards having a monster game. I think she can own that paint much like Angel Reese did. Get some clutch shooting from Nika Mule and Ashlyn Shade. And I think that could facilitate a media upset. Nobody in the Constitution State would be surprised if UConn beats Iowa. But I feel like we're going to break some executive hearts um, at ESPN by not having uh, an, another promo for, for Caitlin Clark to be in the title game. Um, my parents made a comment that she's in every commercial. And... I see it sometimes, but it, it's amazing. It's kind of like when you buy a car and then you see that same car over and over again, but you didn't notice it every once in a while. Once you watch her play basketball, it's almost as if then after that, every one of her commercials comes on, even on the channels that you don't typically watch. Um, so I see that. So I, I have nothing against Caitlin Clark. I think she's a phenomenal player. I wish her all the best. I hope she dominates at the next level. But I hope her college career comes to an end uh, on Friday night in Cleveland. Um, 
and I fully expect UConn to win this game. I'm going to go let's see what the over under is just to get an idea of what they're expecting. 162 and a half. Wow. Uh, yeah, I could see an 87, 84 UConn win. That's what I'm predicting. So, um, Go Huskies! Let's get to the title game and have a have a and, and give yourself a chance to to potentially play South Carolina or NC State, another upstart. And um, let's talk about the my top five with a few honorable mentions. So up to nine players who are the top five players in women's UConn college basketball history, and we'll talk about that after this. The sports calendar is loaded and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet on the tourney. Just talked about the spread in the in the Iowa Yukon game, Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL and so much more. Visit fanduel.com/lockedon and make your first bet a big win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Look for that. Use that promo code. Get some free money. Let me know how you do. All right. So, last segment here. Top five. Maybe I'll go up to nine or ten. But let's 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 just do that. My top five, and I'm going to go from five down. Rebecca Lobo is at five. Lobo was the first truly great Husky. Um, and on the first truly great team, she was inducted into the National Basketball Hall of Fame. She got her number 50 retired. She was the best player in Connecticut's first championship team, as I mentioned. She took home player of the year and most valuable player honors in the final four. She also averaged 17 point double double of uh, uh, 17 points in a double double for her career, helping her to be the all time leading rebounding list to go along with second in blocks. She may not have the, the multiple championships under her belt, but she she is so much more than I think people realize. I think she put a face to the, you know, we talk about stars, right? Um, you know, who are the stars of women's college basketball? She was our first star by far. And I have an honorable mention on my list of Jennifer Rosati, who was her point guard on that team as well. But those two in particular, but Rebecca was the because she was she was a you know Carol Walters was the center, so she was technically the power forward. Um, but as you can see, I mean, she's still a big voice in college basketball. She's on ESPN as an analyst. She does color, uh, you know, uh, does you know she's not a play by play analyst, but she does she's the color analyst on most of the big games. I'm sure she'll be on that Iowa UConn call, which I love. Um, so her impact isn't just on the court; it's off the court as well. Number four, Tina Charles. She is at the height, six foot five. She could do everything that the Husky needed to for her to do and so much more. She's the number four all-time scoring leader, number five in all-time blocks, and the all-time leading rebounder in UConn women's basketball history. When you add on two player of the year awards and a final four most valuable player award, it helps kind of give some perspective on how how incredible her career really was at Connecticut. Um, when you pair that with she was the number two selection uh, in the WNBA draft. Um, she she was she was a 2010 NCAA championship. Uh, oh, pardon me. Um, she she helped UConn win two, uh, two consecutive national championships. And on top of that, Charles predicted the 2010 NCAA championship victory in 2009. So she was let's let's to flip it to the men's side. Let, that's that's like as if um, Alex Caraman came out and said. Hey, so we just won in 2023, but we're going to win it again in 2024. So she backed up a little bit of her smack talk. Um, she's, you know, she broke Rebecca Lobo's all-time re uh, rebounding record. So rightfully so, uh, she should be in that top five category easily. Um, this, this three, these three, and I, I almost, honestly could put all of these three in different categories, but some people are going to not agree with this. But Diana Taurasi is my third. Um, 
I think she's as close to the the greatest of all time as as you can get. But that's how good UConn basketball has been. That I feel like there's two players that are better, and I'm sure you guys know who who they are. But three championships in in the final three years at Stores. She was a role player in the 2001 Final Four team. They lost everybody, and then she came back and and was essentially the dominating force on the last two championships she won. She made that team her own, winning Player of the Year and uh, Most Valuable Player in the in the uh, Final Four twice bringing home rings there on top of these uh, accolades. She, she ranks ninth all time in points. As you know, she wasn't the, the, you know, the prolific score that some of us are kind of clamoring for, but she was number two in assist, making it hard to really argue against her being either one, two or three in really any ranking. So um, this is the one where um, I'm, I think some people are going to differ from me. Um, I have Brianna Stewart number two. It's tough to make um, any sort of argument against Brianna Stewart being the best player in UConn history other than her teams were so good. Um, she is, she's the most, let's put this way, she's the most accomplished player in NCAA basketball history, men's or women's. She won four championships. She is the most outstanding, play, outstanding player of that Final Four during the championship run. The next three years, she collected every accolade possible Three three straight rings again, so four titles, three players of the years, three most most outstanding players of the years. She was the best player on all four championship teams, which is incredible. And it just really kind of puts her in a place. She's the second all time leading scorer, first in in block and shot blocks. She's this is a coin flip for me. She's clear number one for a lot of people. I think she. I, I don't even put her at two. She's one B. My one A is Maya Moore. So. She was number one overall pick in 2011, and where you know she 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 took home two NCAA titles, so she has two less titles than than uh, Brianna Stewart. But she's a four time All American. She's one of the most decorated guards in UConn history. And I and I guess I'm I'm more guard centric, so I think maybe the fact that Stewie Do wasn't a guard per se, uh, I, I lean towards Maya. Um, I, I, but you could go either way with them. She, you know, Maya Moore. I think she just gets overlooked, and and that's why I'm giving her some some love here. Um, and then if we go back, let's let's talk about some honorable mentions. Swin Cash. Oh God, I I, I loved Swin Cash. She she was from 1999 to 2002. She collected two national championships, including an undefeated season in 2002. Um, Cash's career is, I feel like it's underrated and understated, but she brought teams, she was on teams that included uh, Sue Bird and Diana Taurasi, so I feel like some of her legendary performances, uh, like in the National Championship game in 2002, where she had 20 and 13, really helped define who she was in, in her career, but also kind of underscores her her role because there were stars that were a little bit bigger than her in that in that light. And, and I mentioned her, Sue Bird, she's she may not be in my top five, but she's definitely in my top 10. She was the understudy to Shea Ralph, who, God, that's another great name on the 2000 championship year as a sophomore. Um, quickly found herself taking the reins in the final two years as a Husky. She helped the uh, you know UConn to a 32-3 and record in her junior season, losing the final four is something she didn't do again in her career. Um, she was the number six all-time in UConn history in assists. Uh, and even more impressive when you realize she just played eight games her freshman year. So her last three years at UConn were incredible. I already mentioned Jen Rosati. Um, you know, she's a big part in this UConn basketball history. She took it to the next level with Rebecca Lobo. She got, uh, in terms of national recognition, she's a homegrown star. I don't know if she still lives in New Fairfield, Connecticut, but that's where she was from. Um, yeah, I, I again, that's more of a, she was a great player, but she also played such a bigger part in in putting UConn women's basketball on the map, and we appreciate her contributions. And then the last one for me that I want to mention, because I feel like she she got a the raw end of the deal for something that really wasn't her idea, um, Nikisha Sales. She still holds the record for most points scored in a single game at UConn with 46. She did that against Stanford in the 97-98 season. But if you guys remember, she was – she scored 27 points the day during uh, – the, the, and then the next – I feel it was in the same game 
she tore her, tore her Achilles. But so the really the, the crux of it is she was a point away from breaking the all-time uh, scoring record at UConn. So she was home one day. She got a call from Gino Oriema, and there was some controversy about her breaking the record because coach told her, hey, the university and the program really want this for you as a sign of gratitude. This is a quote. Coach told me university and the program really wanted this for me as a sign of gratitude for what I've been done. And she added, so when they put it that way, I was more than willing to do it. So she did ask her mom and her mom told her, no, you're fine without the record. So just to go to show you when it's, there's has something to do with controversy or anything that has anything to do with breaking a record or recognition, ask your moms first. They usually know the right thing to do. Um, so, but she did go along with Gino and, and I guess Gino called her the Villanova coach. They agreed to it. They asked Mike Trangizi, the, I think the biggest commissioner at the time, um, if it was okay. And everyone was on board with it. It was basically a non-story. And then about 20% of the media picked it up. Gino was combative, combative about it. I remember this when I was in high school. So, you know, it's just, it, it ended up being a non-story and I feel like she gets, she gets a lot of crap for it. And in, in, in silly circles at that time. Um, but anyway, she's on my uh, on my honorable mention list for a top 10 player in UConn women's history. So finally, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports today now and available on the free Fire TV channels app. This has been another episode of Locked On UConn. I'm your host, Mark Zanetto. Stay locked in. Stay connected. Make sure your toughness meter is always rising. And as always, go Huskies.